Okay. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. Today is the last lecture before we move into reinforcement learning topics. As a couple course reminders, tomorrow at 5 p.m. we have a tutorial on value-based RL. This should be kind of a, a refresher for people who are a little bit less familiar with reinforcement learning um, and cover the kinds of things that you, uh, the kinds of like reinforcement learning basics that you would see in classes like CS221 or CS229. Um, on Wednesday, the project proposal is due. Uh, like I mentioned before, we're grading these very lightly. Uh, the goal is really primarily for your own benefit um, to give you feedback on the proposal and, and, and so forth. Uh, and then Monday next week, uh, homework two is due, and then homework three will be released. Any logistical questions? Cool. Uh, so for today, uh, we're going to be talking about Bayesian meta learning. And first, we'll talk about why it can be useful to be Bayesian and what that sort of thinking allows us to do. We'll talk about Bayesian meta learning approaches, including black box approaches and optimization based approaches. And then we'll also talk about how we can evaluate Bayesian meta learners. The goals for the lecture are to be able to understand the interpretation of meta learning as inference in Bayesian graphical models and also to understand techniques for representing uncertainty over parameters and over predictions. Um, similar to the previous lecture, uh, this is an active area of research, and so um, there might be more questions than answers. And uh, it will also, this lecture will also cover some of the most advanced content of the course. And so I definitely would encourage you to ask questions, um, especially in like the later half of the lecture, which becomes kind of the more advanced part. Um, yeah, and then we can discuss. Uh, and also, if you don't understand something, um, yeah, it's not your fault. It's uh, most likely my fault. Cool. So um, to recap from last week, uh, or from, yeah, from last week, uh, we talked about a perspective on meta-learning, which is this computation graph perspective where for black box approaches, we view meta learning as kind of learning from data with a black box neural network. We view optimization based approaches as methods that embed an optimization into the meta learning process to quickly learn from support sets. And we also talked about non parametric methods, which um, learn embeddings such that you can do things like nearest neighbors to solve few shot learning problems. Um, we also talked about different algorithmic properties of meta-learning algorithms that can be useful. So, for example, we talked about expressive power, which is useful to be able to represent a wide range of learning procedures. We also talked about consistency, which means that our learner is guaranteed to kind of improve an expectation when you give it more and more data. Um, and these properties are important. Uh, then we also briefly mentioned uncertainty awareness, which is essentially the ability to reason about ambiguity during the learning process. And this can be useful for things like active learning, getting calibrated uncertainty estimates, which is important in safety critical applications, and also in reinforcement learning domains. Um, and it also gives us some more principled approaches. And this is essentially, um, this kind of last part here is what we're going to be really focusing on in this lecture. Great, so why be Bayesian? Um, in multitask and meta-learning, we talked a lot about how we want training and test time to try to match so that you're actually training for the ability to solve, um, to solve the test tasks. And the tasks also need to share some structure. Um, and we always talked about structure as uh, kind of more colloquially, I guess, than really as anything formal. And it's, if you try to think more formally, it's not actually obvious what structure should mean. And one thing that I think, one way I think that's nice to look at this is actually from the, Bra the Bayesian perspective, which is uh, to say that structure means that there's a statistical dependence between the tasks on some shared latent information. Uh, and I'll refer to that, that shared latent information as theta. And in particular, you can think about this graphical model right here, where you have your true task-specific parameters phi i, uh, 
um, there is some shared information between all of the tasks that's represented as theta. And then the data for each task, including the training data and the test data, is ultimately, well, specifically, the, the labels are ultimately a function of the task specific parameters phi i and the inputs x. Um, and here the, the circles are referring to things that are observed during um, that are observed during the process. Um, y test has like a partially shaded thing to indicate that it's observed during the meta training process, but not observed at meta test time. Um, and so note that we don't directly observe theta or phi i, we only observe the data. Cool. And so this is an interesting way to, to look at things, I think, because if you then condition on the shared information, then we can first note that the task parameters will become independent, conditioned on that, that shared information. Um, and otherwise, the task parameters are not independent if you don't condition on that information. Uh, this also means that as a result, you will have a lower entropy. Um, the distribution over um, phi has a lower entropy if you condition on theta. And this means that essentially theta is giving you information about the, um, about the, about how to infer the, the underlying parameters compared to if you're just trying to learn the task specific parameters completely from scratch. Cool, so uh, a thought exercise for you, uh, which is that if you can identify theta via meta-learning, when should learning phi i be faster than learning from scratch? Yeah? So you're saying the mutual information between theta and phi i is not zero? Yeah, so this means that um, the, essentially the tasks are not completely independent of one another. And if they're not independent of one another, then you should be able to learn faster than learning from scratch. And this is essentially exactly what, uh, what I mean by they share some structure, right? Did you have anything to add? Cool. Okay, another thought exercise. Um, what if uh, the entropy of phi i given theta is zero? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So um, in this case, if you could fully determine phi i from theta, this means that the tasks are essentially um, not mutually exclusive. Like they, they share everything, basically. You could figure out how to solve the tasks from theta alone without actually using data, for example. Cool. So this is um, this is essentially the like the way to think about shared structure, and this kind of these different criterion can allow you to think about things like memorization, which we talked about last lecture, which is happens exactly in the second condition. It can also help you think about whether or not you're going to get efficiency, um, like better efficiency compared to learning from scratch. Um, for this first thought exercise, another scenario where this can come up is that. Um, so you already built in structure into your optimizer or into your function approximator or something like that, then in those cases, um, identifying theta won't necessarily be faster than learning from scratch because you already built that structure into your optimization. Cool. Um, and so we can think about a few examples for this graphical model. So um, Say that you are kind of in this sinusoid regression case where different tasks correspond to sinusoid functions with different phase and different amplitude. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on what the information in theta would contain if your different tasks correspond to these different sinusoid curves? Yeah? It's the sine, the sine shape. Yeah, essentially like the sign shape, the periodicity of the function and so forth. So basically, um, theta corresponds to like the family of sinusoid functions that underlie the, the task family. Um, essentially everything but the, the phase and amplitude, which it has to infer from the data. Um, another example is um, you could apply meta-learning to multi-language machine translation where you want to quickly adapt to low resource 
languages. Um, in this case, you're trying to adapt to a new language with data. And so in this case, what does theta, what, what information does theta contain? Yeah? That's like general canonical structure and syntax facts. Yeah, so like things that are general to language, to, to multiple different languages, like that might things like the basic kind of grammar or syntax. Um, some, some languages have different syntax, so you need to uh, only encode the things that are the, the most general. Cool, so yeah, essentially theta will correspond to the kind of the family of all the, all the different languages and the things that's shared among those languages rather than things that are different. Um, great, and you should note that in, in both of these examples, theta is going to be narrower than the space of all possible functions. Uh, this is really important. If it's the space of all possible functions, then you're not going to gain anything compared to learning from scratch. Great. Um, and then one other, one last thought exercise is uh, what if you're doing meta learning and you don't have a lot of tasks? Um, and particularly, you don't have a lot of uh, like data for d a lot of different tasks in order to meta train from. What will happen in that case? And what will theta contain in that case? Yeah? Yeah, so essentially theta is going, in a case like this, theta is going to be narrower. It's going to have, uh, it's going to overfit and it might represent a smaller family of tasks than you ultimately want it to represent. Um, so it'll essentially have this form of like meta overfitting to the family of training functions rather than the entire family of tasks that you care about. Great. Um, so that's the kind of gist of uh, the kind of high level structure of Bayesian meta learning algorithms, or not Bayesian meta learning algorithms, but kind of the perspective of meta learning within these Bayesian graphical models. Um, now, a lot of the algorithms that we've talked about so far are going to give you a single set of task-specific parameters. So they're essentially going to return what you can think of as a point estimate of this, this distribution. Um, in many cases, this might be fine. So in your homework, for example, you've been inferring parameters and it has been getting, hopefully, uh, reasonable accuracy on the problems. In what cases might it be a problem to only recover a single parameter? Yeah? In a multiple setting? What do you mean by multiple? Uh, the distribution, if there are two labels would actually probably work before if you're super uncertain whether the two labels are the same, then you actually give them that. So in a safety critical aspect, it's important to just follow like, hey, okay. Um, if I give you just a point estimate, I have no like, uncertainty or like no uncertainty at all. So that's a problem. But also, if you're given numbers and someone has a really soft handwriting, and so giving it actually two labels would kind of be fine. So um, in that setting, I think it might not make sense that we give like a deterministic output. Yeah, so essentially, if you have uncertainty, I guess first note that this is a distribution over parameters rather than labels, but essentially, if you have a multimodal distribution over possible functions that could explain the data, um, in some cases that might be okay because, um, because maybe. Uh, Especially in, in unimodal cases, like there's probably like one correct answer. But in cases where you have more multimodal distributions and there's like clearly like multiple viable solutions to the problem, um, representing that uncertainty can probably be quite important. Um, cool. So as a few examples, uh, in some cases, few shot learning problems might be ambiguous, and this might lead to multiple solutions, including kind of multimodal distributions over phi, even when you have the prior data. Um, as an example of this, uh, say you wanted to learn a classifier, and you had these 10 examples, so it's a few shot learning problem. Um, and these are your positives, and these are your negatives. Uh, in this case, uh, if you look at these, there's actually a lot of things that could explain what this classifier is trying to predict. So for example, everyone on the left is wearing a hat and everyone on the right isn't wearing a hat. Um, also, everyone on the left is smiling and everyone on the right is not smiling. Um, and 
also, the, at least according to the labels, they think that everyone on the left is young and everyone on the right is not young. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but um, there are essentially these multiple underlying attributes here. And as a result, this means that when it comes time to get a classifier for these things, uh, you're not sure which you should be classifying on. Then ultimately, if you get um, someone that's smiling and wearing a hat and is not young, for example, it's just inherently ambiguous what the correct answer is. Um, as another example, maybe you have someone that's not smiling, wearing a hat, and young, um, and it's also ambiguous. Um, and so these, in, these, in these problems, it would be nice to be able to represent a distribution over classifiers that, for example, cover different combinations of these attributes so that you could ultimately, um, ultimately do something about reducing that ambiguity, like asking a user to, um, to help you reduce that ambiguity. Um, and so in particular, it'd be nice if we could be able to generate hypotheses about the underlying function and be able to essentially sample from the distribution of phi i given theta. And that would allow us to sample classifiers where one classifier might only pay attention to smiling, one might only pay attention to wearing a hat, maybe it would pay attention to a pair of these attributes, and so forth. Um, and if we could generate these hypotheses, then this will be um, first important for safety critical few shot learning problems like medical imaging. Um, it's helpful to know if it's certain about a particular outcome or if it's uncertain about a particular outcome. Um, it could also be useful for learning to actively learn so that if you have some data set of unlabeled examples, it can tell you, give me a label for this and that will help me reduce my uncertainty. Um, and uh, we won't really talk about it today, but there are actually some papers that uh, explicitly looked at, look at active learning with meta-learning um, that are listed there if you're interested in learning more. Uh, and then lastly, it can also be useful for learning how to explore in meta-RL, where you want to uh, try to find, seek out parts of the state space, seek out parts of your world that help you reduce the ambiguity. Okay, um, any questions on the setup or, or the graphical model that we talked about before, um, before we go into the algorithms? Okay, so we're gonna talk about both black box approaches and optimization based approaches. And we'll start with uh, the black box approaches. And um, I guess in particular that this first approach will be general to all of the different methods. And what we can do is we can have this F function output the parameters of a distribution over the label Y test. Um, and in classification problems, you're actually already doing this when you train with cross entropy loss, because uh, you have kind of loaded, so you'll have probabilities for each of the classes. Um, and you, you do this, uh, you can do this in classification, you can also do it in regression, um, where instead of uh, outputting probabilities for each class, you output the parameters of a Gaussian distribution, like the mean and the variance, or the parameters of a Gaussian mixture. Um, so yeah, it can be probability values in a categorical distribution, mean and variance of a Gaussian, means variances and mixture weights of a mixture of Gaussians. Um, you could also do kind of an autoregressive distribution as well for sequential labels. Um, and then once you kind of choose the, the way to parameterize your distribution over the labels, you can just optimize with maximum likelihood. Um, and when you do cross entropy, you're actually already doing this. Um, and you can also do that with these distributions as well. Um, so I guess in some ways, uh, you have sort of already implemented kind of V0 of a Bayesian meta-learning algorithm. Um, this approach is very simple. Uh, you can combine it with a, all of the different methods that we showed before. Uh, however, uh, it has some shortcomings. And in particular, you're only reasoning about uncertainty of the label rather than uncertainty over the underlying function. So in particular, you're thinking about P of Y rather than P of phi I. Um, and this, means that you can't determine how kind of uncertainty across different data points is related to one another. And for example, in the classification we saw before, you can't sample like a classifier for young and a classifier for wearing a hat. Um, also, uh, the distributions over Y that you can represent easily are somewhat limited. Uh, we saw kind of these 
like a Gaussian or a mixture of Gaussians, um, and you ultimately might want to represent more expressive distributions. Um, and then it's also worth mentioning that uh, things like standard cross entropy loss tend to produce somewhat poorly calibrated uncertainty estimates. Uh, typically, when you train with standard cross entropy, um, the uncertainty or the, the probabilities of the outputs don't actually reflect the probability that the classifier is correct for that class or for that example. So um, now without us, like, I think this is the final thought exercise for you, which is that um, here we're doing maximum likelihood training over the labels Y. Can you do the same sort of approach, except do maximum likelihood training for the parameters phi instead? Does anyone have thoughts on this? So for these approaches, what we did is we had, we're outputting a distribution over Y, and then we do maximum likelihood training for, um, with like a cross entropy loss or something like that to get that distribution. Yeah. Um, it should be possible, in my opinion, for you to use the sample with your model parameter, for example, and then have some kind of elbow or some kind of uh, two screen figure, which is approximately some kind of distribution for those files, and then fit that to our data that we've done. Yeah, so you're saying that it should be possible if you can sample different phi's. Exactly. And where do those phi's come from? Those phi's would have to be learned from the data that you're given. So you'd have to learn the phi's for the data that you're given? Do you have something to add? I think similar, but just sample different data sets for different phi's. Sample different data sets for different phi's. How big data sets? Sample one phi, phi one, phi two. Yeah, so I think that essentially what you're getting at is that for each of the tasks that you have, um, you want to essentially somehow get labels for phi by training a model on that data set. And then once you have those phi's for each of those data sets, then you can use kind of supervised learning onto those phi's. Now the tricky part that comes up here, which you might have realized is that, um, I mean, I guess there's a few things. Like first you don't get these phi labels for free. Like the y's come for free in your data set. Um, and so you have to somehow like be able to get samples from fi like five for each of your tasks. You can, you could train separate networks to do that, although you may not get like full coverage over phi, which is actually ends up being quite difficult in practice. Um, and then the second problem is that you would then be doing supervised learning on phi, which um, may not actually represent the, um, may not actually, uh, like the loss function over phi may not actually represent the loss function that you care about, and errors in matching phi may not translate into errors into y, um, may translate into like much worse errors into y, for example. And so kind of the short answer for this thought exercise is that uh, it's extremely difficult to do maximum likelihood directly over phi, uh, because you can't directly observe samples from phi. Whereas if we go back to the graphical model we saw before, um, we do actually directly observe samples for the labels Y. And so a lot of Bayesian meta learning algorithms will kind of amount to trying to get better algorithms for getting distributions over phi. Um, and in particular, I guess, I'll just quickly go back to the, um, back to the graphical model that we saw before. And so, as you can note here, you can see that um, at least the Y train is observed directly, whereas phi is not observed directly, and that's what makes it challenging. And as kind of a hint towards what we'll see next is that you can essentially think of phi as a latent variable in the sense that it's not directly observed. And this means that a lot of the techniques that we have for using, for dealing with latent variables, like variational autoencoders um, and other things, can be applied for learning distributions over phi. Cool. So um, as we kind of start to think about how we can actually represent P of phi given theta, um, I'll just briefly overview some of the tools that we have in our, to our disposal uh, in order to solve this problem. 
Um, this is a very kind of broad one slide overview. Uh, if you want a more kind of thorough treatment of this, um, CS236 provides more, uh, more details on a lot of these approaches. Um, and the, really the goal of these tools is to be able to represent distributions with neural networks, um, including distributions over latent variables rather than just observed variables. Um, so the first tool that we have is latent variable models and variational inference. Um, this will be one of the biggest tools that we'll use. Um, and we had the, the tutorial on this um, last week. The way that these algorithms work very roughly is to try to approximate the likelihood of your latent variable using a lower bound, like an estimated lower bound on that likelihood. Um, and for example, the, we have like the, the variational autoencoder, which thinks about a latent variable Z and an observed variable X. Um, and in reality, those don't have to just be X and Z. You can kind of rename those variables and this, the whole framework still applies. Another class of approaches is Bayesian ensembles. These methods essentially try to um, represent samples from your distribution as different particles. And basically the way that they work is you train separate models on different bootstraps of your data. So you resample your data in different ways. You train a model on each resampled data set. Uh, and then each of those resampled data sets often um, will essentially correspond to a kind of different samples from your, your distribution. Um, another class of approaches is Bayesian neural networks. These approaches try to actually learn an explicit distribution over the space of neural network parameters. Oftentimes it's the Gaussian distribution uh, because that's one of the things that's easiest to deal with. Although sometimes um, it's somewhat unsatisfying because Gaussian distributions are limited in what they can represent. Um, there's also a class of approaches based on normalizing flows. Um, these approaches are pretty cool. Um, they learn an invertible function that maps from some latent distribution to a data distribution. Um, and for example, you can kind of translate between uh, a nice Gaussian distribution to a more complex distribution, such as these, um, I don't know what it's called, uh, these kind of hemisphere distributions. Um, and then lastly, there's also uh, energy-based models and GANs, which um, essentially try to estimate an unnormalized version of the density. And um, this essentially corresponds to trying to push down the data and push up everything else. Um, yeah. So uh, we're really gonna focus on the, the first two Class of, classes of approaches for solving problems uh, in, in Bayesian meta-learning, uh, but I figured that I would briefly mention these because they're also uh, cool approaches and could also be used potentially to develop Bayesian meta-learning algorithms. Um, so the, the, yeah, these last three approaches could be useful when developing new methods. Okay, um, so let's start with variational inference and in the first class of approaches. And in particular, uh, one of the things that you would have seen in the tutorial if you watched it is that we can think about this graphical model right here, which is a very kind of simplified latent variable model where we have some latent variable Z and some observed variable X. And the, uh, if we care about maximizing the likelihood of X, we can derive a lower bound on this likelihood which corresponds to the equation on the right, which is essentially uh, estimating the log probability of X and Z when sampling uh, under the expectation of this inference network Q plus the entropy of, um, of that inference network. Um, this can also be written as uh, this form right here, which if you've trained variational autoencoders, you might be a little bit more familiar with, where essentially you, uh, sample from your, your generative model, maximize the likelihood of those generations, and then um, minimize the KL divergence between your inferred latent variable and the prior. Um, in this case, P is representing the model. Um, it's essentially representing this generative process of the data. Uh, and you would represent P of X given Z as a neural network that takes as input a latent variable or a value of a latent variable and maps it to a generated data point, such as an image. And then the distribution over your latent variable is typically represented as just a standard Gaussian distribution. 
So this is like the two components of your model, which you can use to generate data um, uh, that follows your data distribution. And then Q of Z given X is representing your inference network. Um, it's also referred to as the variational distribution. Um, and it represents the um, kind of the likelihood of different latent variables for a given uh, X. Um, and then typically we'll refer to model parameters as theta and variational parameters as phi. Um, this will be, this is a bit of a kind of overload of notation compared to the meta-learning terminology that we've referred to before. Um, and I'll, I'll, when we kind of use these, we'll try to be careful about those, um, careful about that. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, shouldn't end up being too much of a problem. Okay, um, so now if you look at this objective, uh, typically you try to maximize these lower bounds on the likelihood so that you are ultimately max, like trying to do something similar to maximizing the likelihood of your data. Um, now there's a problem if you try to maximize these objectives, which is that you have this sampling distribution Q of Z given X that you're sampling from, and you need to differentiate through that sampling distribution in order to optimize, in order to appropriately optimize your inference network. Um, so essentially you need to compute the derivative of the expectation of Q with respect to Q. Um, and the, the nice thing about using a Gaussian for Q is that you can uh, use what's called the reparameterization trick, which is that um, for a Gaussian random variable, you can represent it as the mean plus the variance times some noise. And uh, the right-hand side of this equation, even though you're actually sampling, the right-hand side is actually fully differentiable into, me into the mean and, and variance. Um, that, this allows you to essentially backpropagate into that sampling distribution and optimize the objective end-to-end. -end. Okay, so uh, this is kind of some background content and uh, is what was kind of a very brief overview of what was covered in the tutorial. Now, we'd like to be able to use these tools for meta-learning, and really a really kind of core conceptual leap that we'll be making is that this variational autoencoder is looking at a latent variable Z and an observed variable X, but it really doesn't need to be Z and X. Uh, can be these, the same kind of tool in the same lower bound can apply to graphical models with other kinds of latent variables such as when we make the latent variable phi and, and the observed variable, the data. Cool, so the way that we can do this is we have our data um, and we'd like to, um, say for, for black box methods, we'd like to be able to have a neural network that outputs the distribution over phi given our training data. Um, and so, uh, and then ultimately this phi will be used to make predictions for, for new data points when we sample from that distribution. Um, and so in the standard VAE, we had this observed variable X and the latent variable Z, and we were able to derive the elbow. In, um, and, and P was the model that was represented by a neural network. Q is an inference network. Now, in the meta-learning case, we have an observed variable, which is our data. And we have a latent variable which corresponds to the task-specific parameters phi i. And what we can do is we can essentially derive an elbow that just replaces z with phi and replaces x with d. Uh, and we get an objective that looks like this. Um, and then we have a couple choices here. So You'll note in this objective is that we're kind of maximizing the likelihood of the data given phi. This is actually fairly standard. Um, this next approach is we're actually going to have an inference network that's going to try to infer phi. And in this variational lower bound, your choice of Q can actually condition on anything that you want. Um, and uh, what we can do is we can have this Q condition on our training data. So essentially our inference network is going to be inferring the task specific parameters given our training data. And so this uh, equation on the top right is the exact same as this equation here, except now we've changed our variational family to condition on the training data. Um, and this is uh, somewhat analogous to the elbow here, 
except we made a particular choice, which is that instead of conditioning on all of our data for phi, we're only going to condition on the training data. And this is pretty useful because if we then want to infer our, our latent variables, our, our task specific parameters from training data, we can do so even from a tr small training data set rather than from a larger data set for that task. Okay, um, and then one last thing that will change uh, is that instead of, what, what I mean kind of modeling the distribution of data given phi, we'll have this correspond to our test examples. Um, and making this explicit difference between train and test allows us to explicitly kind of optimize for generalization. And so essentially what this corresponds to is um, really the, almost the same thing as black box meta learning, except we now have this KL divergence term that encourages the inferred parameters to be, um, to be close to the Gaussian prior over our task specific parameters. Great, um, then you might also be wondering what about the meta parameters theta? Um, these meta parameters theta, uh, they can essentially be uh, kind of folded into your, your, inference, uh, your inference network. Um, they could also be a part of your prior as well. Um, essentially these meta parameters are going to be what you're going to be using to, um, to infer your task specific parameters. Um, if you want, you could also condition on theta here, and that would correspond to something like the uh, like an approach that doesn't directly output phi, but also um, incorporates other parameters, like an RNN. Yeah. Is this one in the bottom left uh, for the KL divergence, the the Q part? We have Q of uh, just phi. Is that supposed to be conditioned on our data as well? Because yeah, is that missing intention? Yeah, so it's a good question. So the question is, uh, should Q here be conditioned on the data? Um, so if you match this, this bound directly, it would be conditioned on the data. Um, for your variational distribution, it's typical in variational autoencoders to condition your inference network on X. But in reality, uh, Q can actually condition on whatever you want it to. Um, X is simply the thing that gives it information about Z. Um, as you'll see on the top right, we're actually going to choose to condition Q on the training data. We could also choose to condition it on all of the data for the task. Um, we're actually gonna, we're gonna choose the training data so that at test time, we can infer the task specific parameters given our training data, which is um, given a small training data set, uh, which will be quite convenient because then when we do few shot learning at test time, we can infer a distribution over phi given the, the few training examples. Does that make sense? So to recap, we essentially took the variational lower bound, um, viewed da the data as our observed variable, viewed phi as our latent variable. Our inference network is going to be kind of doing the, uh, the process of, adap of adaptation, essentially, of learning our task-specific parameters. And the process of optimizing this lower bound will be, uh, will be the process of meta-learning, essentially. Um, our kind of final objective for completeness looks something like this. Um, and the, essentially what this is doing is it's now just, uh, for, for its simplicity of, of notation, I dropped all the, all the sub i's on everything. Now we're, if we look at this full um, equation, we have an expectation over our task distribution. And then we're actually inferring parameters phi i given training data set for task i. Um, yeah, yeah. Where we not yeah, great question. So uh, you're asking why aren't we maximizing over the, the phi as yeah. well? Um, so you'll notice here that we're only doing a maximization over theta. And here phi corresponds to the latent variables. And we're doing, uh, we're like inferring those latent variables given the training data set. And just like as we saw in the meta learning process, we're only optimizing over theta here because phi is more like a latent variable, more like activations, and less, um, and less like a underlying, um, like an underlying parameter. Um, this is potentially where the, the overloading notation that I mentioned before can get a little bit confusing, is phi, I, or phi is no longer representing the parameters of the inference network, like in standard VAEs. 
um, it's representing the, the latent variable. And so in VAEs, for example, we don't optimize over Z because it's a latent variable. Yeah? So with the terminology, can I interpret it as an encoder, which is trying to write by theta, which learns a value from training theta to phi i? Yeah, exactly. So you can, like, in a sense that this is like a variational autoencoder, you could sort of view this as an autoencoder that um, where the latent variable are these parameters and the thing that you're inferring, that you're autoencoding is the data, essentially. Yeah. So your B is the unit that's taking the data and outputting the fine lines, right? Um. So in this case, actually, Q is the neural network that's taking in the data and outputting the phi i's. And P is the, the neural network that is, um, that is then taking those phi i's and making it's pr predicting labels from those phi i's. And so in the terminology that we were using before, uh, Q corresponds to F and P corresponds to G. Cool, so here's the, the equation again. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the first approach that we'll see that can actually represent a distribution over task-specific parameters. Um, and this is kind of a black box variant of the approach. Um, and this alleviates kind of the, the shortcomings that we saw with trying to do something like maximum likelihood. Um, this means that it can actually now represent non-Gaussian distributions over the test, over the labels, because it'll represent a Gaussian distribution over phi and then predict the labels from that, uh, from samples from that distribution. Um, and it, like, uh, the important bit is that it can produce a distribution over functions rather than just producing a distribution over labels. Um, there are some downsides with this approach. Um, this means that it can only represent Gaussian distributions over phi i. Uh, and this can be unsatisfying if we want to be able to represent more diverse distributions over functions. Um, although if you do have a very deep network, Gaussian distributions can actually, they do actually end up being somewhat expressive. Um, yeah, and that's the, that's the only con of this approach. Cool, um, so this is uh, the, I think that if you were to do a Bayesian meta-learning algorithm with a black box approach, I think that this is a pretty good one to use. Um, I'm also, I'm not sure if there's any particular paper that, that goes into this, but if you're interested in kind of reading more about an approach that looks like this, we can, we can also send some paper references. Great, um, so now let's talk about some optimization-based approaches. So one way to look at it, um, one way to look at kind of optimization-based approaches is actually through a, a kind of somewhat crude Bayesian lens. And in particular, um, if you think about your graphical model as this, which is essentially the same as the graphical model that we saw before, except we're now collapsing the, um, the, the data sets into a single node. Um, if we're trying to maximize our, the likelihood of our data, given our metaparameters theta, we can essentially use what's called empirical base to write out that, um, write out that likelihood as, um, as the expression, expression below, which is an integral over our task-specific parameters phi, representing the data given phi and phi given theta. And what you can do is you can kind of somewhat crudely approximate your uh, distribution of phi i given theta with the MAP estimate, the maximum a posteriori estimate, um, and this is a, a reasonable pr approximation in cases where you have a very peaky distribution, where the map estimate corresponds to a large part of the distribution. Um, and one thing that's kind of cool is there is actually this connection between gradient descent and early stopping, aka kind of what things like MAM will do, and doing map inference, uh, in particular under a Gaussian prior with the mean at the initial parameters. Um, and this, you can actually show that there's actually an exact relationship between map inference and gradient descent with early stopping in the linear case. Um, in the nonlinear case, it's approximate. 
And what this tells us is it essentially gives us a Bayesian interpretation of the MAML algorithm, where you can view um, MAML as optimizing under this kind of approximation, you can view MAML as optimizing for a, uh, a Gaussian prior or the mean of a Gaussian prior, um, such that when you do map inference, you, um, you get a, uh, a good solution. Um, so this is one cool interpretation of the algorithm. That said, uh, with this interpretation, we're not able to sample parameters. Uh, we're using this map estimate to estimate the distribution of phi given theta. And uh, as a result, it isn't kind of too useful from a Bayesian perspective because we're kind of getting rid of the thing that makes it Bayesian, which is that we're using this point estimate rather than the full distribution. Um, and so in terms of developing an algorithm, we'd like to develop an optimization-based algorithm that actually kind of represents this distribution over phi given theta. And so if we recall the, the, the objective that we saw before for black box methods, um, one thing that you can kind of remember is that Q, I mean, the, the, the inference that were Q, it can really be an arbitrary function. It can condition, condition on a variety of different things, and it's just a function that you learn. And so the first thing that you could think about in terms of an optimization-based algorithm is what if we put a gradient operator into Q? Um, and instead of using a black box method, we could essentially use a kind of incorporate gradient descent into the inference process for Q. Um, and then you get uh, an algorithm called um, amortized, well, an amortized Bayesian meta-learning algorithm where essentially Q corresponds to running SGD on the mean invariance of neural network weights with respect to your training data. Um, and so in particular, uh, instead of having a neural network that outputs phi i, um, given your training data, you're going to have, um, theta is gonna correspond to this mean and this variance, and this network qi, um, it's no longer going to be a neural network, it's going to be a procedure that runs gradient descent on those parameters with respect to your training data. Any questions on how this works? Now, one thing you might be wondering is like, how can we run gradient descent on a mean and a variance? Um, to do that, we can essentially use the same reparameterization trick that we saw before, where we essentially the neural network weights, we're gonna be representing this distribution over phi i, and um, I'm gonna get out a whiteboard marker. So Q of phi i, um, sorry, Q of phi i with respect to D train and theta. Um, theta will correspond to this mean and, uh, and variance. And then this function is going to be running gradient descent on your mean and variance where you, um, in particular the way that you run gradient descent is you'll use the reparameterization trick again, where you'll get um, something like uh, uh, a sample, not sure how best to represent this. You can essentially sample from this data by taking uh, mu plus sigma times some noise where sigma is drawn from a standard Gaussian distribution. And then treat this as your, the, the weights of your neural network and backpropagate into these two values and you'll be essentially running uh, gradient descent with respect to uh, mu and sigma where the um, phi i will be represented as, or this distribution over phi i will be represented as a Gaussian distribution um, with mean, kind of running out of notation to use, uh, mean mu i and uh, variance sigma i, and this is going to be 
these two variables are going to e be equal to um, running gradient descent on mu with respect to your training data and running gradient descent on sigma with respect to your training data. Um, and in particular, this will be um, when you run, when you backpropagate your, the loss of your training data into mu and sigma, this will be actually a function of your current um, over kind of the parameters that are represented by this. Any questions on how this works? seeing more confused faces than not. So Yeah. So, so once you get mu and sigma for five, then what do you do? Right. So the question is once you get mu and sigma for phi, what do you do from there? Great question. So um, this this distribution is represented by mu i sigma i, which you get from running gradient descent. Um, once you get that, then you, um, you can then kind of plug those in to our objective from the black box meta learning algorithm and do the same thing that we did before, where we're going to be kind of optimizing for the, the lower bound on the, the likelihood. Um, the, and so uh, in particular, the, yeah, you'll be optimizing on the lower bound. And then at test time, after you optimize for this inference network, what you'll do is you will have your mu and sigma and you'll have a training data point, you'll run gradient descent, and so you'll get each of these parameters. And then what you can do is you can now sample phi i from this particular Gaussian distribution. Um, and so uh, you'll then be able to sample parameters from here, and then that will be, um, those will represent, like samples from this will represent things like a classifier based on age, a classifier based on hat, and so forth. Yeah. Clarify about the different mu's and sigmas for myself. Um, so the the theta mu and sigma is kind of like this shared global uh, mean invariance of our of our distribution, and then what we do is we refine it for a specific class with SGD. Yeah, exactly. So phi and sigma are like a shared global mean invariance, and then we'll refine this mean invariance with respect to a specific task, with respect to the train data, and that will give us a distribution over parameters for that particular task. Yeah. So Interpret uh, update how mu i and theta i as the inner local adaptation and uh, the uh, and the uh, update on theta as like uh, of a loop optimization. Yeah, exactly. So this gradient descent process is the inner loop, and then optimizing for these parameters um, with respect to that objective corresponds to the outer loop. Yeah. So, uh, I guess, I guess things, um, just things that we're optimizing, but practice to the probably like, you know, the parameters of the neural network or something like that. And, um, yeah, so um, the mu and sigma here, this is, this kind of now corresponds to your theta. And these are, this is what you're optimizing over. Um, in practice, what this will be is, um, you'll essentially have twice the number of meta parameters. So before you just had a, like parameters in MAML, you just had like the initialization of a model. Now you're going to have a mean of that initialization and a, a variance. And um, so you're essentially going to have two vectors that are the size of your parameter vector rather than just one. Yeah. So once we have this mean and the variance, we'll run gradient descent to get the mu i and sigma i, and then we'll sample from this Gaussian distribution to get um, to get weights over a task-specific neural network. Yeah. Is this making our updates when you showed us the initial uh, figure? You said like you'll go in one direction to update, and um, because you're looking like you'll have a central point and then to go to one path, so take that update and like adding 
uh, because we're going to have noise for it. It's probably going to be some sample noise. And we're just making those updates not as like they could trail off, in a sense. Yeah, so... And so the network has to be robust by taking the gradient steps against the noise. Or could one see it like that? Yeah, so we had this diagram before with MAML where they, like this is kind of your final meta parameters and then this is uh, like by i hat and so forth. And yeah, essentially the way that you can think about this is that now instead of having a single point, you're going to have these kind of Gaussian distributions. You'll have a Gaussian distribution over theta and this will correspond to, you'll have mu and sigma that reads this. And then now for each of these, you'll also have kind of your own Gaussian distributions over these parameters and this corresponds to um, like phi i and sigma i for each of those tasks. Um, the, and then ultimately this distribution will cover the set of parameters that work well for that task. Um, and so rather than having a single point, you'll have a, a distribution over those parameters. Does that answer your question? I think so. And in the update step, like, and because in the update step, you're going to have noise, right? And so my update steps in the direction, they're going to have to be more robust, right? Theoretically speaking. So the updates will be with respect to, you'll be differentiating kind of through the parameters of the Gaussian. They won't necessarily have noise per se. Right, yeah. You will be sampling epsilon for each of these steps, and so you the will have noise. Before it was just zero, right? Or epsilon was zero, so we just had a mu. Yeah, before epsilon was zero, and you just had mu, exactly. Yeah? Are these mu and sigma part of like the fire distribution and the KL divergence that we're trying to have the corresponding back to the reach conference? Yeah, exactly. So these this mu and sigma um well sorry, actually. Um this mu and sigma are the um are your your kind of parameters for your task specific distribution and then you'll have this KL term that encourages these mu and sigmas to be close to a, a standard unit Gaussian. Yeah? So the difference between like this Q as a gradient operator and like the black box one is that in the previous one, um, rather than optimizing the mu and sigma, we were just like Q was outputting the mu and sigma and then we just directly sampled for, for from that to so feel that we are doing it um, for task like in the last yeah, exactly. So in the in the black box approach, um, instead of having running gradient descent, we just had some function. Uh, I can't, uh, I'll refer to it as I'll refer to it as f um, that takes as input uh, mu and sigma and d train and outputs um, mu i and sigma i. You could essentially think of it as just like a neural network that takes it that produces these these things. Necessarily need, need to be restricted to Gaussian. But um, this doesn't need to be a Gaussian, and so this can just be like theta. Like you don't really need it to be anything. Um, this is still restricted to be Gaussian because the um, because we're going to be on the slides. You see, you have the expectation with respect to Q, and you also have this KL divergence. To optimize through that expectation, you need it to be Gaussian to use the reparameterization trick. And um, for the KL, it's also convenient for it to be Gaussian so that you can measure the KL divergence in closed form. Yeah, so, so far we've only seen approaches that have a Gaussian distribution over phi i. Um, on the next few slides, we'll see some non-Gaussian approaches as well. Yeah. Does the loss function for the inner loop include a, a forward pass through through P? Yeah, so this is going to involve a forward pass through the network parameterized by mu and sigma. Um, that doesn't necessarily uh, correspond to P per se. Um, because a p here is representing kind of the model that has parameters phi i, but I guess in that sense it like it is taking a forward pass through a neural network that's parameterized by um, by samples from phi and sigma. Yeah. 
Cool. Um, so the benefit of this is, uh, unlike a black box approach, you're still running gradient descent at test time. Um, and you are actually, you're, so you're running gradient descent at test time, and you are getting a distribution over parameters by running gradient descent on the mean and the variance. The downside, of course, is that we're still modeling phi i as a Gaussian distribution. We're just getting these means and variances. Um, so can we model a non-Gaussian posterior is kind of the next key question. Um, so the first thing that we'll look at to get a non-Gaussian posterior is to use ensembles. Um, and ensembles are pretty nice in the sense that it's actually very easy to get non-Gaussian posteriors because essentially uh, different, you're representing different samples from your posterior rather than the posterior distribution itself. Um, and so uh, they refer to uh, this algorithm as kind of an ensemble of, or the kind of base version of an algorithm as an ensemble of mammals or, or e-mammal. Uh, and this will essentially just train M independent mammal models. Uh, yeah, completely independently. Uh, here's an ensemble of mammals. And yeah, it's also worth mentioning that you can also use ensembles with black box and non-parametric methods as well. And that will also give you um, that will also give you essentially uh, non non Gaussian posteriors. Yeah. Uh, how do you make sure the um, mammal models are independent? Yeah. So how do you how do you ensure that they're independent? Um, typically, what you do is you kind of train it. So I guess there's a few different ways to do it. Um, typically, you'll definitely make the initialization, the random initialization of the algorithm different. You'll also change the random seed so that they see batches in different orders. Um, the kind of theory says that you should also train it on different bootstraps of your meta training data, meaning that you should resample your data and not use um, all of it. In practice and deep learning, people have found that you don't need to do that. You only need to change the random initialization and the seed that's used for the mini batching. Um, and that will already usually give you pretty good ensembles. Um, so this can work pretty well. Uh, it won't work well if the ensemble members are too similar to one another. Um, and this can sometimes happen because you're, I mean, you're training on the same data. Uh, and so there is an alternative to the approach that actually tries to make the ensemble more diverse and what it does is it essentially has an ensemble, but it tries to push away the particles. It tries to push away the different parameters um, from each other. And the way that this works is you train an ensemble. And so J here is indexing the different ensemble elements. And then you have this repulsion term that's referred to as this kind of kernel uh, between, um, between um, the parameters. And um, this will essentially try to make it so that the ensemble members are, are more different from one another. Unfortunately, getting good kernels in weight space is difficult. Um, and so this can usually help to some degree, but, um, but it doesn't always uh, help that much. Um, and here's an example of a more diverse ensemble. Um, Great, and then you optimize, uh, of course, for the distribution of particles to produce high likelihood. Um, cool, and so here's what the likelihood term looks like, um, which you will, yeah. Cool, um, so the benefit of using ensembles is that it's pretty simple. It tends to work quite well for, non, for, for producing non-Gaussian distributions. Um, the downside is that you often need to maintain different instances of your model, and so this can be computationally expensive and also uh, memory intensive as well. Um, one trick for getting away from this downside is to have the ensemble only over the latter part of the network and to have a shared backbone um, where you're essentially doing kind of gradient-based inference on the last layer only or the last few layers, um, and this actually does does help a lot with memory and computation, of course. Um, it often produces less diverse ensembles, but um, 
but it can be pretty helpful. Cool. Um, great, and then I guess any questions about ensembles? How often do you in real world tasks do we need to have a non How often is Yeah, so the question is how often do we need non Gaussian distributions? Um, it's kind of hard to say. Um, I think that, I mean, in some ways, I think the objection to Gaussian distributions is more like philosophical in some ways than, than practical because it seems just very inelegant to have like a Gaussian distributions over parameters when your parameters are like a neural network and they probably are like, probably the true distribution over parameters is like very much not Gaussian. Um, I think that uh, there is actually a paper that shows that if you have a super deep network, um, Gaussian distributions can represent a lot. And the intuition for that is that if you have something Gaussian at the first layer, then the neural network will transform that distribution, like the later layers of the neural network will transform it into something that is very much not Gaussian. Um, and so I think that it varies. If you can use a pretty, if you're using a large network and you really um, care about performance and practice, then Gaussian distributions are probably fine. Um, if you, don't like Gaussians in weight space, or um, or you have a smaller network that is probably less sufficient. Yeah. Verify for the previous approaches with black box and um, like the optimization based Bayesian method on it. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be a Gaussian, but it could be any other distribution that we can parameterize with some set, set of parameters. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be Gaussian. Like the, the main reasons why we're using Gaussian is because of the reparameterization re trick and because the KL divergence is easier to, like you can measure it in closed form for Gaussians. Um, the, the first one is really the big one, is like how do you backpropagate through sampling? Um, you can approximate that for other distributions as well, although the approximations are a little bit ugly, like there's, um, and, and just like rather hacky in general. Um, like you can try to like there's things like the Gumbel softmax and the straight through estimator that try to like um, backpropagate through discrete things. There are some like approximations that you can use for mixture of Gaussians as well. Um, but in general, like backpro backpropagating through sampling for non-Gaussian distributions is uh, rather difficult. Explain how the reparameterization trick is helping with this gradient like propagation. Yeah. So. Uh, I'll do this slide. So um, we need to backpropagate into this Q. So we have this expectation with respect to Q. We're going to estimate this expectation by sampling from Q. And then we need to backpropagate into the distribution that we're sampling from. Um, when, you have, uh, when you have a Gaussian distribution, you can represent samples from that Gaussian distribution with this form, um, where you sample, you can essentially kind of decouple the noise from the parameters of the distribution where the noise corresponds to um, some standard Gaussian distribution. And this, because it has this very nice form where it's decoupled, you can actually very nicely backpropagate into mu and sigma by sampling this noise independently and then running your gradient through with that sample noise. And it's because it kind of decomposes it into the noise and the distribution parameters that makes it possible to, to backpropagate into. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was um, in the ensemble based approaches, how do you combine the predictions into a single prediction? Um, the, the, one of the most common approaches in deep learning is to take the distributions and like, like do some sort of like majority vote, for example, like the thing that is the most likely. You could also average the distributions. Um, we'll see in a couple slides how we can use them for other things as well. Um, but those are the, the two most common approaches. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so related to that question, so like, uh, with the two ensemble that we put together learning, do you usually like keep, uh, like keep the models independent all the way through, like even like uh, uh, training that meta test time? Do you keep the models independently even when like, like, adapting at meta test sure. time? Yeah. Um, yeah, you do. You typically do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
And so even when you're like adapting a test time, you'll be kind of running gradient descent with respect to each of the models independently, and then you'll get a final prediction. Yeah. Isn't it solving basically to sample different parameters by and so so we get a lot more and yeah, so um, if you want a lot of samples from Phi, you need an ensemble for every single sample that you want. Um, if you want like 100 samples, then you need 100 ensemble elements. And so, um, yeah, it can be pretty expensive because you usually want M to be fairly large and uh, you're fairly limited by that. Um, in practice, when people typically use ensembles, they use, I don't know, um, like three to 10 instances, sometimes I mean, it really depends on the application, but that's kind of a ballpark estimate for what people do. Um, and if you have more compute, you can do more than that, of course. Uh, yeah, and that's that's one. That's why this con like definitely is uh, potentially a big one. Cool. Um, and then the last method that we'll cover tries to get a non-Gaussian posterior over all the parameters without requiring M model instances. Uh, we don't have too much time, so I'm gonna go through this somewhat quickly because I also wanna get through the last part. Um, and in particular, we're gonna try to sample parameter vectors with a procedure that looks like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, HMC, it maybe sounds kind of complicated, but it, uh, the way that it works ends up being fairly simple. Uh, the way that it works is you add noise um, and then run gradient descent from, from the perturbed weights. And so in particular, kind of intuitively what we'd like to happen is say that we're in the example that we saw before. We wanna learn a prior such that if we kind of randomly add noise and like randomly kick the parameters, that will put us into different modes of the distribution. And so if you have a very multimodal distribution over weights, such as like classifiers corresponding to different attributes, we want to be in a place where if we kind of are at the top of this and randomly kind of add noise and then run gradient descent, um, we'll get into one of the modes of that distribution. And so if we add noise to theta, we'll then push it in one of these directions will then run gradient descent, which will then put us in the, um, in the producing a classifier that has, um, has those different attributes. Uh, so that's the intuition. Um, the way that it ends up working is we have some initial parameters theta. We're gonna be adding noise to this, so we're gonna have a Gaussian distribution where adding noise to it essentially corresponds to sampling from that Gaussian. Uh, we're, the mean is the starting point. Um, so we're no, no longer gonna have a single parameter vector for that initial parameters. We're gonna now have um, a mean and the variance just like we had the mean and the variance here. Then we're going to sample a phi an, or an initial phi by um, ultimately by trying to uh, represent this distribution. We want to be able to represent this distribution. Unfortunately, this distribution is, uh, like, well, the first thing that we can mention is that's independent of X tests. It really only depends on the training data. Um, ultimately, this distribution corresponds to this really nasty integral uh, over our initial parameters theta, which we don't want to deal with. This is really intractable. And so what we're going to do is um, say that we knew the distribution of phi given theta x train and y train. Um, and in particular, we're going to just set this distribution to be gradient descent if we have a sample of theta. Then if we have this distribution, then, then sampling is very easy because we can sample a theta and then sample from this. And um, it kind of transforms the graphical model into something that looks like, like this, where you sample from theta, sample from phi given theta and the training data. Um, and so the key idea is that we're going to essentially estimate this distribution as like the map estimate, like the crude approximation that we saw before. Um, and we can approximate this with map inference with like a few steps of gradient descent. This is very crude. It's also very convenient. Um, and uh, 
essentially we're going to represent this distribution as running one or a few steps of gradient descent starting from the sampled theta. Um, and then once you, if you do this approximation, then you can again do training with the same kind of a procedure that we did before with amortized variational inference. Cool. Um, so then what ancestral sampling will look like is just the same as what we saw before, where we have our mean of our Gaussian distribution. We add noise, by, which corresponds to sampling from that distribution. And then we run gradient descent from that, uh, from that, sampled, uh, from that sampled theta to get to the mode. Um, that was pretty quick, but the benefits of this is that you can get a non-Gaussian posterior. Um, it's pretty simple at test time because you just sample and then run gradient descent, and you only have one model instance, although you do have, um, you still are going to have the double parameter vector rather than just one. Um, the downside is that it is a more complex training procedure. Cool. So to summarize the methods that we talked about, um, version zero just outputs a distribution over Y test which is quite simple, but doesn't allow us to reason about the distribution over task-specific parameters. We also saw black box approaches, which use these latent variable models and amortized variational inference. And this can represent non-Gaussian distributions over Y, um, but it can only represent Gaussian distributions over phi. Um, and then we also saw optimization-based approaches. We saw how amort you basically take this approach and stick a gradient step into Q, which, um, which is simple, uh, but gives you only Gaussian distributions. We saw on ensembles, which are also simple and tend to work well and give you non-Gaussian distributions, but you have to maintain M model instances. Um, and then we also saw hybrid inference, which gives you a non-Gaussian posterior and it's simple at test time, but it's a lot more complex during training. Cool. Um, and then the last thing that I'd like to briefly go over is actually evaluation of these meta learners and how you use them. Um, one thing you could do is try to use standard benchmarks, but the downside here, well, the benefit is that they're standardized, they're real images, there's a good check that it didn't break anything, but the downsides are that oftentimes me metrics like accuracy don't actually evaluate how well you're doing at representing the distribution over parameters. Um, also, some of the standard tasks may not exhibit any ambiguity, and so it may be that you're good with a point estimate, you don't actually need a distribution, and uncertainty may not be useful in the data set. And so, what are some better problems and metrics? Um, ultimately, it's going to care about the problems that you care about, but um, here are a few examples. So, uh, one really simple example that's not necessarily representative of a practical problem but allows you to look at ambiguity is um, these kinds of regression and classification problems where you give it a family of like sinusoids and linear models. You add noise to the, to the data points such that um, in some of the examples, like the third example, it's actually somewhat ambiguous whether it's a sinusoid or a linear curve. And you can see whether the model can capture these different modes of the distribution. Um, likewise, you could give it ambiguous classification where you have like only a single support example as represented by the blue cross or the blue plus sign. And then you can see that it can represent different decision boundaries um, by sampling different phi's, uh, including decision boundaries that cover the true decision boundary, which is shown in, in gray. Um, so this is one example. Um, another example is you can look at generation, ambiguous generation tasks where you get just like a single view of an object and you want to be able to generate other views of that object. Um, and here's an example of a, of a black box Bayesian meta learning algorithm that can kind of represent the ambiguity. Whereas if you just use like a CV, CVAE, it doesn't represent the ambiguity well. Um, and you can also look at the reconstruction. Um, another example is the ambiguous classification task that we saw at the very beginning of lecture, where you need to classify on, uh, it's kind of unclear what you need to classify on in terms of the attributes. Um, and you could measure things like accuracy as well as how well it, covered it covers the different modes of that distribution and also the negative log likelihood of the classifier. Um, and then one last example is looking at uh, reliability diagrams and calibration error 
Um, and what this is looking at is looking at the confidence of the classifier versus the accuracy of the classifier on those data points. And you want this to be a perfect kind of diagonal line. And then kind of for standard meta learning algorithms, you see that they aren't perfect. Um, they tend to be uh, overconfident. They have more confidence than their accuracy. Whereas for uh, Bayesian meta learning algorithms, they improve on this metric. Um, cool. Oh, and then one last thing is uh, also looking at active learning. So you can use the, the uncertainty to select data points that you want labeled and pick data points that it's the most uncertain about. Um, and you can use algorithms like this to get better performance with fewer additional data points. Um, so this asks for one additional data point, two additional data points, and so forth. And this allows it to reduce its uncertainty faster and get a more accurate predictor faster. Um, and you can likewise look at this in terms of like mini image net accuracy, for example. Cool. Um, we're out of time, so I want to wrap up there. Um, a couple of reminders. We'll be starting reinforcement learning on Wednesday, um, and Carol will be giving the lecture on Wednesday. Um, and if you're a little bit rusty on reinforcement learning, I'd encourage you to go to the tutorial. <laughs>